And Charlie cares, and thank you for that, Tony. I really appreciate that. I really do. Uh, you know, at least you've seen it. I don't know who else has seen it. Charlie Cairns, hello, Jerek, he says. That's nice. And Mark Quinnish says, I'm going to bring him in now. And I'm going to, read, I'm going to bring him in and read the question. Okay. And there, there he is, the man himself. There's Jerek. Hiya, Jerek. Oh, you can't, can't hear them. Yeah, are we there? <laughs> I'm having a gremlin or two tonight. <laughs> I should, I should do. Yeah, I should do. But, but at least we can hear you, Zeddy. Mark Kinnish has. Mark, I'm sorry about that. Mark Kinnish has um has a question. He okay. says, "I want to ask. I had to, what I want to ask is, was the true." Was it that true when the Beatles were live, they couldn't get a real good sound because they couldn't hear themselves due to the screaming fans? Absolutely. I mean, that, that's that's reported so many times. What it was, I mean, if you look at um, those big American stadium gigs, um, the PA they were using was, you know, it was a baseball stadium and the stadium they were using was the same, PA, well, the, the PA system they were using was the same as the announcer um, uses just to talk to the crowd about what's going on at the match. It wasn't a proper PA system. Wow. And they couldn't hear themselves because they had a tiny back line, a couple of three AC-30s, Vox AC-30s. Um, so, you know, you can, you can imagine that the chance of them actually hearing themselves is zero. And I've heard so many interviews with uh, each of them saying more or less the same, uh, the same thing. It was a real problem. I mean, I remember going to a Stones concert around that time, Satisfaction 65. Uh, it was at a, at a cinema, ABC, I think in Chester. And so it's about a 1500 seater. And as soon as the Stones came on, every girl in the audience was screaming at the top of a voice. So you can imagine what it's like with like 10, 15,000 people uh, screaming. So I would think that's absolutely the case. Well, uh, I, I remember Lennon in an interview, years later, obviously, and he said, uh, he said, you just, we, we couldn't even hear ourselves talk. Yeah. You know, when a song finished, we couldn't even hear ourselves talk. He said it was terrible. And that's, if you're, if you're, it's like being at a football game. It yeah. really is. It's like being at a football game when they're, they're roaring there and you're saying, what? And these are the people next to you. Yeah. And you're trying to catch up what they're saying, you know, if you're having a conversation or trying to have a conversation. Yeah, exactly. So you can understand that. So you empathise with yeah. everything. Well, I did as well, uh, Lennon was saying, what Lennon was saying. Yeah, and Tony good. Barton says, uh, Hello, Derek, and he, he gives you the oh, pint. He oh, gives you the pint. <laughs> I shall look forward to that later. <laughs> it's good, though, isn't it? Anyway, Derek, uh, what were we talk, talking about? Are we talking about Hawkwind tonight? Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Uh, yeah. band. We're mostly looking at the 70s because that's very much their golden age, and that was when all the classic characters uh, were in there. Although the thing about Hawkwind, I, I saw this um, interview and it said something like 50 people had passed through their ranks. I mean, a really right. interesting band. I mean, they started out in the, the late 60s. I mean, Dave Brock is the only guy. He was the founding member and the only guy that's still in the band. And they're still on the road today. They've got um, gigs lined up. I think it's about four of them, various festivals across this year. Uh, on my website, I do this page called um, uh, 60s and 70s bands who are still on the road. And so on the website, rockandrollunravel.com, uh, just go to that and you can see where they're playing. I mean, it's astounding. I mean, they've yeah. had eight hit singles, three of which were Silver Machine, but they've had 27. This is according to official charts. They've had 27 UK hit albums. And that's across from 1971, the first one, uh, through to uh, 19, uh, 2021. So it's like wow. 50 years of hit. They did have a gap of about 20, 20 years in the um, early 2000s. Absolutely incredible for no real reason. There's 19 year difference between two of the hit uh, albums. Yeah. 
I mean, they came together, interestingly enough. Uh, Dave Brock was in a band called uh, Famous Cure with uh, Mick Slattery. I don't know how many people caught it, but Mick Slattery sadly died about 10 days ago. Oh. And he was uh, one of the, uh, he was in the very original guitarist, uh, original band. And what happened uh, was that they, they met uh, another key character, uh, Nick Turner, when they were out in... Uh, uh, gigging in uh, in Amsterdam in in Netherlands, and they came back to the UK. This is around uh, August '69, um, and they formed a brand called um, Group X, and they they played this twenty minute um, jam session. Basically, it wasn't a proper gig as such. They they just sort of uh, bluffed their way on, and uh, John Peel was in the audience and said to uh, the manager uh, Doug Smith, I think. Uh, look out. Well, no, they, they said to the guy who organized it, Doug Smith, uh, you want to look out for these guys. Uh, so, so he signed them up. I mean, John Peel telling you that, you know, you're going to you're going to think about it. Yeah, um, they, they were Hawkwind Zoo um, before they decided on the name uh, Hawkwind. And it, in, in the summer of 70, they released the first single and album, uh, which didn't actually do. Uh, that was Honey on Dun Sundown, you know, one of the songs uh, that features in their set ever since. But commercially, they didn't do too much. But interestingly, the Isla White 1970 gig, that's the uh, uh, the Jimi Hendrix uh, one, they were actually at the festival, but not part of the official festival. They were at, uh, uh, with uh, Pink Fairies at what was called Canvas City. And somebody set up this inflatable tent just outside the perimeter. And uh, Hawkwind uh, played at that. Sometimes you get referred to, gets referred to as a free concert, but it wasn't really, because a lot of the time was spent arguing between Hawkwind and the organisers. Hawkwind wanted to charge two bob for the punters, and the, the organiser wanted to charge uh, ten bob. Hawkwind offered to pay free if the money was spent on food for the people there. I mean, they were a very people's kind of a, a band. They were very much from the Notting Hill, uh, Labrook Grove area, very, very... Um, well, radical at the time, White Panthers and all kinds of stuff they were um, involved with. Um, and it, it's around the sort of 71, it starts to get really interesting because that was when Stacia joined. That's the girl dancer. And what happened was... Can I, can I come in there, please? Can I come in there? Do you know, do you know like Silver Machine, for example? Yeah. yeah. Like, I think everybody in the world seen, as even the aliens have seen... <laughs> that particular uh, uh, video. Absolutely. And do you know what I thought? That Honestly, I, I really thought that that was just a girl who got up on the stage and was dancing. I really did. I didn't yeah. really. And where she, she actually comes out and sings, like, you know, coming to the end of the uh, yeah. the record, um, Silver Machine, doesn't she? And I just thought it was a take. I really did. It no, just it's shows it's... you, yeah. you know, uh, uh, how you how you view things and you've got everything wrong if you know that's what I mean. But yeah, go ahead and sorry, man. I, I no, just no, I, I mean, she was very much part of the band. I mean, she, uh, she first danced on stage with them at Red Ruth in Cornwall on the fifteenth of April, seventy one. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I've seen a, a written interview of her. This is this is her version of the story. Um, she went to the band. She went to see Nick Turner, and she'd met at the Isle of Wight. And she asked the band because she was a, she was is an artist, a performance artist, and all that kind of thing. So she asked the band if they could get if she could get up on the stage, and they said, "Yeah, absolutely, providing you take off all your clothes and you paint yourself." So <laughs> she duly did this. I'm not sure if they had any paint, and so she danced naked this first time. And then about three weeks later, she became really a part of the uh, the touring band. Uh, fascinating, fast. Apparently, she was six foot two. And wow. rather, yeah, so a, a statuesque uh, kind of a lady. And Lemmy uh, joined about the uh, the same time. We're in the sort of summer of <clears throat> seventy one. Apparently, um, it was probably a squat rather than a flat share. Uh, he was with a guy called uh, Dick Mick, who was one of the electronics um, stalwarts of the early part of the story. Um, and he'd gone along, Lemmy had gone along to a, a Hawkwind gig. The thing about Hawkwind, it was no Mothers of Invention, you know, it was not a tight band. People would turn up, not turn up, it, fairly arbitrary. 
And this particular gig, uh, Lemmy was there. Dick Mick was playing uh, the sort of uh, keyboards, but a very electronic uh, sounding, swishy whirling um, stuff. And th the bass player hadn't turned up. So Dave Brock said to, to the audience, can anybody play the bass? And Dick Mick pointed to Lemmy and said, yeah, he can. Lemmy, had, I'd seen Lemmy in an interview saying this. Um, Lemmy had uh, never picked up a bass guitar in his life. <laughs> but he, he played the guitar, but he, he got yeah. up on stage, and, you know, the next thing you know, he's part of the uh, part of the band. The, band and yeah. the next key character to, to get involved very much is uh, Robert, uh, Bob Calvert. Um, he, he was a, or, well, yes, that was, he died, uh, a poet and a lyricist and he used to get up with them and he'd do poetry readings you know all very uh, very arty very very hawkwind and that sort of escalated and by the beginning of 72 he was part of the band and they had a really key and this is where the whole uh, silver machine story kicks in and that's a fascinating one in itself um they, they played a gig called the greasy truckers it was um uh, a benefit for somebody called the Greasy Truckers, who were a sort of group of people, Notting Hill based, who used to put on concerts and, and give the money to good causes and all, all that kind of, very much part of the free concert culture. Were yeah, these uh, like motorbike people? Yeah, the, uh, the uh, Hell's Angels actually crop up yeah. uh, in some of the uh, uh, the gigs towards the end of the uh the 70s but what happened is it was an interesting gig because it was a sort of microcosm of the time this is february 72 and the three main bands there were man a prog band hawkwind who were just starting out space rock and uh, brinsley brinsley schwartz who were um very well known uh, pub rock band pub rock was just starting <coughs> to to move so you know it's um it was it would have been an interesting gig and what happened was they played their set and they played Silver Machine as part of the set. Um, but when they released the album, a double album called Greasy Truckers, uh, Silver Machine wasn't on it. They decided, because it was such a powerful song, that they'd release it as a single. But the, the vocals on the, uh, the recording that night weren't that good. So they wanted to record them again. But uh, Bob Calvert wasn't available. I mean, sadly, Bob Calvert had a lot of mental issues. He was uh, bipolar. And um, apparently he, uh, I mean, he had regular major breakdowns. I mean, his story about when they were on tour in, uh, this is towards the end of the 70s, on tour in France. And he went out literally, according to this interview, with the, a band member talking about it. He went out and bought a couple of handguns and a couple of grenades. I mean, this is um very much the, the time of uh, a lot of uh, ira activity and various european bad of meinhof gang as well absolutely exactly by the meinhof so you know you could imagine you could on the streets of paris if you talk to a couple of three people uh soon get hold of stuff and he found the band got he, he got quite obsessed with guns apparently and blade swords and he'd wave them around on step well not so much the guns but uh <laughs> the uh swords he'd wave around on stage and this French tour apparently it got so bad that the, the 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 band had a meeting without him there and decided that they had three gigs left to, to go and they decided that um, they they could they they were, they were a bit concerned with grenades in in carrier bags uh, so they they uh, jumped in the car shot off and as they were leaving the hotel he saw them and apparently chased them down the street with his sword um, I mean the guy was uh, I mean it, it's one of these very poetic artistic people and i think it was all wrapped up in the uh the was he certified by the way was he sanctioned something was he sanctioned uh, I, I i think he was at uh at one point uh but by and large it, it it sort of came and went i saw one thing that said i think uh, one of the band members in an interview i saw was saying that his mother had told him he has a serious breakdown about every 18 months and what had happened you know he'd he'd, he'd have a bit of a meltdown and then um later sometime not too long later often he'd be a lot better and because the guy was such i mean he he was he was uh one of the lead vo well probably the lead vocalist but he was he was a major vocalist in the band and he, he was a major songwriter as well you know he was a poet lyricist and he wrote an awful lot of stuff with uh, dave brock in fact you know if you look at the albums and you look at the songs and who um, was doing the writing. Pretty much most of the band get credited. Lemmy wrote uh, quite a lot of 
quite a lot of stuff as well. And they got involved in the in the very early days with um, uh, Michael Moorhead, uh, Moorcock, the um, science fiction writer, and they did some major projects with him. And I mean, he'd get up and and some of the songs he wrote, he, he would sing. But when I say sing, I mean, very much that was often more spoken, spoken word across a swirling um, background of, um, of music. Well, who wrote, uh, who wrote uh, uh, Silver Machine? Because that's the most iconic. Yeah, uh, that, was, uh, that was Calvert and, uh, and uh, Dave Brock. And apparently he got the idea when he was riding his bicycle around London, ringing the bell. And he thought, I'm on my silver machine. Because they were all like, they, they were out on acid almost all of the time. Um, I mean, I, I've, I've said, that, you know, Lenny's joined the band now. The big difference with Lenny was that um, he was heavily into speed. He liked to be up for three or four days all day and then sleep for three or four days. The others were all tripping out on acid. So they were uh, hippy dippy, uh, you know, oh, hey, oh, it's all melting out there. And um, so, you know, there, there, there was a bit of clash of culture um, sort of at, uh, at times. And what happened uh, in, sorry, Frank. No, I was going to say, um, I always thought, because I seen them at the stadium, I seen them at the stadium, Liverpool yeah. Boxing Stadium in 71, oh. 72 or something like that. Yeah. I, went, I specifically went to see them and Motta Hoople. Yeah. And I, when they came out, well, you know, you, you, we never seen them coming out over anything. They'd be yeah. just on the stage. And then all of a sudden, the lights around the stadium was flashing. And then like stuff, smoke sort of thing. And yeah. What it was, I thought, and when I listened to the lyrics of uh, Silver Machine, I just I only listened to the lyrics, whatever. Not at, at the stadium, I'm talking about before that. Yeah. yeah. I always thought, because don't forget to say in the sky, you know, yeah. taking off and in the sky, I thought it was a UFO. Yeah. I really thought it would be singing about a UFO. Not only that, but as I said, when I was in the stadium, <clears throat> Excuse me. When I was in the stadium, I, you know, you could be sitting there and thinking that there is a UFO, if you know what I mean. It was absolutely, oh, absolutely. fantastic. Can I just read out a few comments? Absolutely. I just need this. Uh, Neil Broderick says, I met Lemmy uh, Kilminster in 2011, Lands of No, performing with his band Motorhead. That's mm. Neil Broderick. Steve yeah, Evans really says, cool. my mate Jeff Holmes is a massive Orkwin fan. I am as well. And uh, Steve Evans says, it's a pity the stadium got knocked down. You, you wouldn't Coco because people often ask me, uh, you know, about the stadium. I, I'm just going to say this. Because it was the very first purpose-built boxing stadium in the whole yeah. of the country. And it was brilliant. They had boxing, obviously. They, they had world uh, title fights there. Yeah. They had wrestling uh, was there, big, big uh, concerts there. And as I said about Orkwins and Motta Hoople, mm -hmm. and one of the, what we went to see, what I was there, there seeing, was uh, one of the support groups was Queen. Oh, right. <laughs> so we had all these magnificent, yeah. Yeah. even Led Zeppelin played there, uh, yeah. say Steve Evans. Hang on, just let me read these and I'll get right back to you. I'm sorry. It's and Neil Broderick says, uh, The Rolling Stones arrived, their gig, Give Me Shelter on Els Angels motorbikes. Yeah. Uh, contrary to a widespread misconception, it was under my thumb and not sympathy for the devil that the Stones were performing when Meredith Unser was killed. Right. Altamont. Yeah, that's incredible, isn't it? You know, so the yeah. lads, you know, who are coming, these are musical fellas, by the way. Oh, you know, yeah. they love all the, yeah. everybody. Uh, yeah. The thing is, you see, I met Lemmy myself. Uh, I was to, you know, anyways, it's down by Merseyside, and um, 
there's Lemmy, and he he, he he has all the gear on that you see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all the leather gear, the hats and everything, the cowboy hat, leather hat. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. And I, I, the only thing, I, I, I kicked myself, actually. You know, when I said, uh, uh, when I was just saying to you about, I thought it was a UFO. Yeah. And uh, I really wanted to say, it sounds to me, you know, the uh, silver machine was a UFO rather than yeah. a motorbike. You know, yeah. I wanted to say that, but I was just talking loads of nonsense, like I'm talking now. No, you know, no. just uh, but he was a lovely, lovely man, and yeah. not long yeah. after, you know. Yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry. They're talking Led Zeppelin, Robert Plant, but still rate Steve Marriott over them. That's that's what Steve Evans says because Steve. Steve Evans is a great Steve Marriott, uh, you know, yeah. the small faces. Absolutely. I thought they were absolutely. I'd love you to do something on them at, at some point. Yeah. Right. So, go on. Oh, Quince, I'm sorry. Oh, the silver Machine's interesting because the uh, when they came to put the single out. They oh, yeah. Just... I'm sorry. I, I'm awfully sorry. You know, <laughs> you're going to carry on, you know, because then you, you think about this question, okay. what Neil Broderick says. Question for Jenny. Where do you rate free? Okay, don't answer now. Just talk about uh, what you were going to talk about motor uh, right. Sorry. Uh, and that was free, the band, Paul Rogers and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what I was going to say was um, they're really big hits. I mean, it should have been a Bob Calvert vocal, but it wasn't strong enough and he wasn't available. Um, uh, to, to, to re-record it when they came to re-record it for the single because he was hospitalised with, you know, bipolar, manic depression. Um, so apparently each of the band tried to sing it and none of them could um, hit the high notes and they gave it to Lemmy. He, he apparently uh, did it in two or three uh, takes. And because that really, that's very much what shot um, Hawk Winter fame, they were on top of the pops. And apparently uh, Lemmy was on uh, the NME uh, from cover on his own and I, I saw two interviews actually while I was sort of looking at the background for this and in the Lemmy interview he said that the the band were really uh, unhappy um, about this well not quite the words he used but uh, you know was uh, seriously uh, not impressed um, and Dave Brock uh, when he was asked the question um, he said oh we didn't mind <laughs> But I, I think Lemmy was probably closer to the to the truth because the one thing about Hawkwind was that it was a band that was absolutely, you think the Beatles, Lennon McCartney thing, uh, they fell out a bit. I mean, everybody kept falling out with everybody in Hawkwind. People used to go um, up to Dave Brock and say, look, if so-and-so doesn't leave, I'm leaving. And that happened uh, a few times. And it's interesting you should say uh, at Liverpool Stadium, you're probably there, Frank. Um, on the 2nd of uh, July, uh, June, the uh, Space Ritual um, Alive album hit the, the charts. And that's really, they, that was a very, very lavish stage production um, that was funded <coughs> out of the whole Silver Machine thing. And it was recorded live. Excuse me. <coughs> recorded live in Liverpool at the stadium and uh, Brixton... Uh, sundown, so that might well have been the gig you were at, mate. Yeah, yeah, most <laughs> people all could have easily have been. Yeah, As, but yeah, there's something. Um, before you go on to uh, uh, you've got to answer that question about free, by the way. Mm. Steve Evans says, uh, but Mark Kennis first, he says, Well, the small faces were brilliant, sha la 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 lee, oh. and all or nothing, you know, absolutely amazing. And Steve Evans says. Love the Orkwind LP, Hurry on Sundown. The first yeah. Orkwind MP, uh, LP, he says, uh, one of the great psychedelic pop tunes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, one of the really yeah. early ones. And yeah. they were great. I mean, Free, I, 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 I've always been a big uh, Free fan. I mean, All Right Now is one of the most famous riffs of all, all time. Uh, I, and David Kossoff, I thought, uh, they always call him David. That's his dad. Um, I can't remember. Uh, David Kossoff's the dad, uh, Kossoff Jr. 
guitarist. Yeah, no, because David Koshoff was a very famous actor, wasn't he? Oh, that's right. He was in, uh, oh, he did a few sitcoms um, and things. Not only sitcoms, but he was in uh, The yeah. Sparrow Can't Sing, a bunch of unicorn, oh, right. you know, this kid yeah. going around looking for a unicorn or something. Yeah. Like oh, that. It was a very famous actor. 50s yeah. film with yeah. Diana Dawes, by the way. A yeah. young, very young Diana Dawes. Yeah, well, I like Diana Dawes. Yeah, I thought I thought they were a, a great band. I, very laid back. Uh, funny enough, I saw them at uh, some two or three. Paul is his first name, says Mark Kennish, Paul Cosser. Paul, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, lads, yeah, lads on there. You, you, you get a name in your head and you just can't get it, uh, get it out. Yeah, when I saw them at uh, Liverpool Stadium, uh, they were topping the bill and Mott the Hoople uh, were on before them. And Mott the Hoople was such an awesome live band um, that they really stole the, uh, stole the show. Um, yeah. I mean, Free were, were brilliant. I mean, they, they yeah. really had some excellent, excellent stuff. So, you know, I've, I've always rated uh, Free. Can I ask you something? Because mm -hmm. it's only what you said there about, uh, you know, like... He stole the show or whatever. I'll just go on to these first before I, I, I say this. Um, Steve, Steve Evans says, Kossoff, basic, bass guitarist, and Paul Rogers, belt, he, he had a belt of voice. And Paul Rogers, says Neil Bradley, was the voice. Now, here's my, uh, here's my thing. We're in a band, me and you, right? And Steve yeah. Evans and Neil Broderick and Mark Kinnish, you know, we're in this big band and we were brilliant. You know, everybody loved us. But there was another band, if you know what I mean, that yeah. were after, they were stupendous as well. Would there be any, any animosity if they were on a same venue together between yeah. them? Have you ever heard of any animosity with bands? Because well, you, you, I'm sorry, I, I have to go back to that particular gig. Yeah, uh, I went to see Mott the Hoople. Yeah, right. And they were fantastic, as you say, yeah. brilliant. All the young dudes when they sang that, oh, great. But Arquins, I thought that they stole the show. Yeah, I thought that they stole the show. And don't forget, not the Hooper with the, you know, the, the, they were up there, if you know That's what right. I mean. Yeah. Two, uh, you know, the billing, in other words, the billing. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry I, I, I went there, but I had to say that. Yeah, no, talking about uh, two bands on the same bill. I mean, interestingly enough, I mean, Nick Turner, who was in the band from the very beginning, the group X Days, uh, towards the end of the 70s, he was sacked. Um, apparently, uh, they kept warning him. He was a sax player, uh, and he used to play very, very improvised uh, sort of sax solos. But sadly for the others, he'd play them across, you know, when people were singing. And uh, it, again, you had a situation where a couple of people um, went up to Dave Brock and said, look, either we go or he goes. And uh, Dave Brock actually uh, did then sack uh, Nick Turner. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, he, he was an absolute founding member. But the reason I, I bring it up in that conversation now is, he did get back with um, uh, Hawkwind uh, just uh, into the 80s. Um, and then in the second half of the 80s, uh, he formed his own band. He left again. Um, and he formed his own band called uh, xhawkwind.com or just xhawkwind. Um, and he was played. There's a famous instance where he was playing um, at some festival, and Hawkwind were playing the festival. Nobody was quite sure which one was Hawky, Hawkwind. Because the thing about Hawkwind lineups is that yeah. they have come and gone across like 30 years. Uh, yeah. So it well could well have had um, other original uh, members. And what happened was that uh, Dave Brock had uh, along the way. Uh, copyrighted the uh, or trademarked it would be wouldn't it trademark the the name Hawkwind so he sued uh, Nick uh, Turner and stopped him using the <coughs> using the name so you know often you know, people can, uh, can well it's, it's like uh, that reminds me to be honest Jerry that reminds me I'll, I'll give you a little break <laughs> while you're uh, <laughs> you're clearing your throat um, that reminds me of the searches, yeah. when they split up, and you had the searches and the searches. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, John McNally and uh, Steve Pender, you know, both both yeah. sides. And yeah. that that was a bit strange, you know, because who did you want to go and see? Who was the yeah, exactly. the best searches, if yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just it, it's just crazy. Can Absolutely. I just read a few comments here? Absolutely. Uh, Neil Broderick, Mock the Hoople, first ever band to do stadium tours, he says, and he could, could carries on and goes, <laughs> We're called Frank's Grumbles. Mark <laughs> <laughs> uh, says, uh, I'm off for that, Frank and Derek. If we start a band, we just need to find a manager. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, what the people say, yeah, it, it is, uh, it, this is a, a, a good one, actually. I'll just read this and a couple of more, and that's it. Um, Neil Broderick says, Mot the Hoople were manufactured and did Led Zeppelin steal Stairway to Heaven? Asked Neil, you know, the same Neil. And um, what do you think of that? What do you think of that? Uh, did Led Zeppelin steal the Stairway to Heaven? Well, I, I think there's, uh, you know, if you listen to, um, oh, I forget the uh, the artist. When when Led Zeppelin went, first went to America, they were getting nowhere fast in 1969 in the UK. Uh, so they went off to, to America and they were with, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the band. I'm awful with names. <coughs> um, but I, I think it was Randy California's band, Spirit. Was it Spirit? I think it was Spirit. And I cannot remember or find the name of the track. But they were playing often unbilled on the same bill and there was a track that spirit uh, were playing at that time and if you listen to the two back to back you know the uh, the famous riff from stairway of heaven you can hear it in this um, spirit track and i mean it did go to court uh, 5 years ago thereabouts maybe 10 years ago and it actually went i think in led zeppelin's um favor but if you do listen to that spirit track and for the life of me i can't remember what it's called it's I'm pretty sure it's on their first album uh you can really hear that um uh that riff but i'd never say they stole it of course because there might be lawyers listening yeah yeah <laughs> it's, it's 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 just crazy isn't it it's yeah. like it's like the beatles for example uh, the most cover there covered song is something. Yeah. By uh, something Harrison. Like, yeah. I think yesterday might be the most covered and something's the second most covered. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. They're, 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 I mean, they're both unbelievably. Stand no, I, I, no they, they're both unbelievably uh, well covered and both great songs. I mean, Harrison is yeah, unlucky in a way being in the Beatles um, in one sense as a songwriter. If he'd been in... A different band he would have been the main uh, songwriter but he just happened to be the band with arguably the two greatest songwriters of their generation i, th I think um i think the likes of bands you know from the 60s you know you're talking about the 70s obviously uh i'll, I'll just read this let zepp say stay uh, stay neil brother at the best manager ever he was a nutter that's what he says Mm. That's Neil Brother. And Steve Evans says, just listen to 19-year-old Robert Plant singing, yeah. Babe, I'm going to yeah. leave you. Incredible vocal yeah. that the 19, that no 19-year-old today will get near. But yeah. I, I'll go with, with the likes of that, what Steve Evans has just said. What Steve Evans has said. What about um, Stevie Winwood? And he was 17. Mm. He was only 17, keep on running. That was yeah. incredible. He had an incredible voice. Mm. And uh, I'll just leave on, on this this uh, final comment here. Derek, do you think George Harrison was talented in his own right? Well, I could answer that, Mark. Yeah, he was. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Steve Evans has answered it. Um, yeah. he'd, have, he'd have been a major songwriter in any other band. Uh, I mean, well, why didn't, the, why didn't John that. and Paul, you know, you know, because he really got fed up, didn't he? Well, yeah, if you, yeah, I mean, if you watch that Get Back, to, you know, 10 yeah. hour documentary, uh, you can really see and you can really see Paul uh, putting him down in the first half until he walks out. And that was a real walkout. I mean, that was no uh, stage. Please come and get me later. No, no. Uh, you know, it, it could easily have been uh, that he never he never came back.
No, I think he's underrated. I did. Uh, I think it was uh, an interview with him <clears throat> when he's saying one of the mistakes he made was he'd written all this stuff, great stuff, while he was with the Beatles. I put it all on his first album, uh, All Things Come to Pass. And what he, what he should have done in hindsight was uh, kept some of them back for future albums. Not that he didn't write good songs after, but you no, know, no. years of stuff uh, that went out on his, uh, his first album. <clears throat> Well, he still had influence, though, didn't he? You know, after the Beatles uh, split oh, up, yeah. Yeah. when he asked the likes of Jeff Lynne and Tom Petty and oh, uh, Dylan and, and the other fella, the, um, uh, the big O, you know, to join yeah, the band. Yeah, that's the right. Travel and Wilbury. So he, he, he yeah, really yeah. did have some sway. Oh, absolutely. But, uh, oh, he's, he's well respected as well, I think, in the, in the whole great scheme of things. Yeah. Derek, you know, you know, like you're talking about the seventies, right? Mm -hmm. So the sixties, right? That that's where I that that's where I you know I grew up with the sixties music, just built in my ears. It, what was the transformation, or did it change in any way? You know, from the sixties into the seventies, because there were still great bands from the sixties into the seventies. Yeah, I think what, what happened, because um, this is one of the topics we're looking at doing, is looking at the 60s itself. And by the time you, I mean, start, the 60s started with beat, around the middle, 65, 66, it transitioned into rock, much, much harder edge, uh, clap, uh, cream, um, Hendrix. And then you had, uh, in the second half of the 60s, progressively from 60 sort of seven onwards, um, you had lots of subgenres uh, coming out. I mean, psychedelia, prog rock, um, bands were getting starting to play with uh, full orchestras. Uh, uh, metal um, was emerging in the late uh, 60s. And then in the early 70s, glam rock started to yeah. uh, come together. And in the early 70s, then you've got the, the whole glam thing going. But you've also got uh, prog was, was uh, moving very much into um, and rock itself moving into sort of stadiums. So they were playing bigger and bigger venues. Um, and that's when uh, punk sort of come out, grew out of that quite uh, sort of naturally. I mean, you could argue that the um, London, the you know, the pub bands, uh, which I think were mostly sort of London based, most of the ones that go into the story of uh, pub rock. Um, but they, they were really, I think, the first to take the music back uh, a couple of years before punk, uh, to small venues and three-minute songs and non-virtuoso uh, guitarists. And, of course, punk came along and completely changed uh, changed that as well. But I think with punk, it was almost more to do with the attitude than it was to do with the, um, the music itself. I mean, the lyrics were all very urban, um, and it was all very much a backlash against uh, prog rock and the excesses um, of some of these big stadium type um, gigs. Well, okay, I'm going to need some uh, some good uh, comments here. Right, so I'll just go down. You might want to uh, answer some actually. Uh, Steve Evans says some talent rounds rounds in those days. Dolphy up there also as a vocalist, loudest band I've ever seen. The and he spelt. The, you know, uh, double up. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, brilliant. Oh, they were brilliant. Well, they are brilliant. And uh, <laughs> Neil Broderick says, Phil Liner was born in England. Also, Shane McGowan was not Irish, as most people think. Okay. Steve Evans, progressive rock. I always favoured Genesis over Floyd personally, but I do love Floyd. Yeah. And it's one of those things, you know, do you like Floyd or do you, you know... Uh, and I couldn't even make out. And as uh, uh, Steve Evans said before, um, uh, he preferred John Lennon to the other Beatles. Yeah. Now, I'm going to ask a question, not a question. It's just like a comment. I, I, you know, most probably you've had this before. Not of me, but of somebody else. Um Floyd number one says, uh, Neil Broderick, uh, Mark Kinney says, yeah. And then you started getting the synthesizers, synthesizer music into the 80s, which is right. 
Mm. One of the greatest 70 bands, Dr. Feelgood, Brillo Bosch, Frontman, Wilco Matt, but Ace Guitarist, Belter Band. Yeah. Like, mm. here's my thing. Let's get back to the, like, the Beatles. Okay, let's get mm. back. I always think, I know you're talking about Brock on the Auckland. Uh, I always think of Auckland with Lemmy. I really do. I don't know oh, why. Absolutely. I always do that. <laughs> Now, here's, here's a little comment, and I want you to answer it. It's only while I put the kettle on, okay? Right. Here's a little comment. If John Lennon, let's pick a year, 66 or 67, 60, let's say 66, at the height of the Beatles, and they were going to go higher, as you know, what if we walked out of the Beatles, John Lennon? I'm just only while I put the kettle on. Answer that. What, would, <laughs> what do you think would have happened? What, what, what do you think no, would I have think happened? I, I, I think that's a really interesting one to uh, to ponder on. Let me think, what would have happened? I think it would have been uh, pretty disastrous, uh, personally, because... Uh, if you look at the uh, the fact that certainly by that stage they were very much down the uh, self composition, so with the odd Harrison, it was very much uh, Lennon and McCartney as the songwriting team that were moving forward. If we take um, sixty six, uh, it's, uh, it's just before Pepper. Having said that, and thinking about this as I'm actually talking about it. What's really interesting is it was that time exactly that Paul McCartney uh, came to the front in the Beatles. Um, the, the whole concept of um, Sergeant Pepper was very much Paul McCartney's um, vision. Uh, the name came about because at the time you had long band names like uh, Big Brother and the, and the Holding Company. <clears throat> and uh, apparently on a flight back from somewhere, uh, the idea came to Paul McCartney that for their next album, what they should do is be in effectively incognito, hence Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. Um, so he was very much, John Lennon was, was very much, you know, he, he now discovered or in the early days of uh, Yoko Ono. And if you look at Magical Mystery Tour again, uh, late 67, that was all Paul McCartney driven. Um, he was inspired by uh, Ken Casey, the uh, the guy that wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, also a beat writer, beat poet. And he famously took this journey across America in a psychedelically painted bus called Further, uh, a bit like the easy rider, you know, two men looking to find America. Uh, it was very much uh, what Ken Casey did. And that was that was very much the, the inspiration for Paul McCartney for Magical Mystery Tour. And going back to jumping on a little bit now, if, if you look at um, that get back thing, just thinking about this, it was very much Paul McCartney that was driving, certainly driving George Harrison. I mean, John Lennon didn't really um, make all that many comments as Paul was uh, sort of um, uh, well, not so much criticizing, but telling George how to play the guitar and stuff. You know, thinking about that documentary, uh, Paul was very much in the driving seat uh, at that time. So, uh, well, you know, well, 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 that, that's a strange, not a strange thing, uh, because I was looking at Lennon and I really thought Lennon would have said something, but he didn't. He, he was no, just, he and you know, there, there's McCartney, as you said, he was trying to mm. say, or he did say, uh, George, or he's undermining him, uh, not, oh, absolutely. Not, not violently undermining yeah. them, but it, it, it was just very subtle, wasn't it? It was very yeah. subtle about it. Yeah. And that's why when he left, he came up to Liverpool, he said, he yeah. that. But we don't know what happened. Yeah. And we got back. No one knows. No one knows. Yeah. And who yeah. went up? Yeah. Who went up there to, uh, you know, it could have been Lennon, could have been McCartney himself. We just yeah. don't know. No, it wasn't documented that at all. And that's a shame. That yeah. is a shame. And the only person now who know, well, two of them, is Ringo Starr and uh, the other fella, McCartney. Yeah. Tomorrow, I'll just go through these, then I'm going to go on a little break, give you time. 
because I'm going to make a cup of tea. We have a little break and we have a, a clip on about uh, some history and, and stuff. Right. <clears throat> right, Steve, Steve Evans says, uh, I'll just go down this. Tomorrow never knows the tune that changed it all. Tomorrow never knows. I haven't a clue what that is, to be honest. It'd be some band. Uh, what I can't believe, says Mark Kennis, John Lennon hated his own voice. I thought he has one of the greatest voices. That's what Mark Kennis says. Neil Brother, if you get a chance, watch Grateful Dead documentary on Netflix. And he carries on by saying Steely Dan was a great band or a great band. Mm. Um, and Steve says, I had them on work last week. He says they were boss. Uh, probably, uh, says Neil Brother, I probably listen to them now. AJA, great album, Love Big Black Cow. And uh, Fran Bry. I don't know Fran Bry. I am Fran, I hope you're well. Wish him well, and my brother Jake, my favourite three songs. Did you like Badfinger? Badfinger were great. I'm going to honestly, I'm, I'm sorry here, people. I've got to uh, have a break because Jason's waiting to put this uh, little clip on, and we'll be back with Derek and his uh, raw throat. <laughs> oh, he's got plenty of water, and Absolutely. we have this clip now. <laughs> What do you think of that? <laughs> oh, scary stuff, mate. <laughs> it is scary stuff. The thing is, as well, um, I know that you've got to go, and I'm awfully sorry. We're doing a two-hour special next month, aren't we? Yeah, uh, looking at the uh, the 60s itself from the beginning uh, through how it all changed to the end. Because, I mean, the, the music scenes were so different on both sides of the Atlantic in the first half of the... 60s and oh, rock music really came of age in the 60s you know you go from the gentle beat of the early 60s to the hard rocking stuff of uh, you know the middle late 60s and it shoots off into psychedelic uh, music uh, all kinds of uh, interesting developments uh, around there and how uh, British psychedelic was very different to American um, psychedelic music I mean, Grateful Dead, who often get crop up in the conversation. If you're talking about Hawkwind, you often find Grateful Dead cropping up in the same conversation. A lot of sort of parallels. Not least of which was that um, Grateful Dead were very, very encouraging of people taping the concerts. And in the uh, 1990s, I think it was, Hawkwind went down exactly the same road. As long as they weren't competing with, you know, a studio album that was coming out from a live album, as it were. Um uh, they encourage the, the fans to uh, take their concerts as well. I mean, they have got, I don't know if it's literally hundreds, but they have got an awful lot of live albums. I said they had uh, 27 or something albums that have actually made the charts. But if you look down, say, if you go to the Discogs site, which is a great place to check out uh, details of albums, and you look down the Hawkwind uh, list of all their albums, there are pages of them. <laughs> Do you know what? It's funny you're saying that because when in like the late, you know, like from 66, 67 onwards, you had the likes of Francis Rossi, you know, with all the, you know, the, the quaff there and everything else. And he must have said to himself, that's enough of this. I'm going to grow <laughs> here. And, you know, then they became uh, obviously a, a great metal band status exactly. quo. Exactly. And I just want to, I just want to, these before you go, let me go through them. Let me go through them. And maybe you can answer a, a, a question here. Not a question, but it's something that Steve Evans has said and uh, Charlie Wood. Right. Just let me finish, Derek, and, you know, then I'll let you go. Yeah, answer them first, please. <laughs> yeah, sorry about this. No problem, mate. Uh, Steve Evans says, you don't even know tomorrow never knows, Frank. No, I don't. I don't. This, this is me, this, because he, 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 he comes up with all these bands, you know, and I've never even heard of them. And whatever, even today, you know, he comes out with these bands because he still goes to, you know, live gigs every week, more or less, to Steve Evans. And Charlie Wood says, tomorrow never knows a track of Revolver album. 
one chord played backwards. I want you to go back to that. And then Steve Evans says, touch on last track on Revolver. So he's uh, Steve Evans. And Lynn Ellis says, I love this. <laughs> and uh, what a chord says, Steve Evans. And, and Mark Kenny says, um, Derek, did you know the Beatles very nearly got back together around 76? There was certainly talk of it, I heard. Yeah. And uh, let, let me just go. Brilliant, that Frankie says, uh, Tony Barton. And Neil Broderick, I'll just finish on this one. I'll just finish on this one. It's uh, <laughs> great, this. The last one is great for you, Jerry. Um, Neil Broderick says, um, no, Tony Barton says, brilliant, that Frankie. Thank you, uh, Tony. When I last watched Motorhead, this is Neil Broderick, the drummer was a guy called Nicky D and not Peter Gill. Don't really know much about D. That's what he says. Uh, and Mark Kenny says, uh, Mark Kenny says, I love the chain part, Frank, in the toilet. I think he did outtakes of that on St. George as well. I did, and indeed. And uh, Charlie Cairn says, Good night, Terry. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> so, what, what do you think of, uh, you know, uh, the likes of. Uh, but it was I'm sorry about this. Uh, well, 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 the Beatles getting back well, together. What tomorrow never knows. It's back up Revolver Amble, uh, album and one called Play Backwards. What's yeah, the, the Beatles very much, and I think a lot of this is down to George Martin as well. Um, they started around the time of Rain um, doing uh, backwards tracks. I think that Rain was the first time they actually did that. And the story is that John Lennon took... Uh, tape home to listen to and wound it round the the wrong way and actually played it backwards accidentally and I thought oh well we'll have a bit of this um, and that ended up there and they were really starting to uh, experiment I mean that's just as we're coming into uh, Pepper which I suppose arguably is the most experimental um, album so they, they were they were very I think that's why one of the reasons the Beatles really are. Uh, to the side of everybody else. I mean, they, they evolved um, across the area, you know, by the time they got to Revolver, they'd come an awful uh, long way themselves and they were starting with the uh, experimental uh, music then. And they, they really got stuck into it with, um, with Pepper. And I know that uh, the Beatles, there was, I can't remember the guy's name, I think his name was Sergeant, um, an American uh, promoter who offered the Beatles, I can't remember the number, a million dollars, two million dollars, whatever the number was, big number, uh, to get together again. Uh, but, uh, you know, sadly, they uh, they never did. Do you think they would have done if uh, 1980 wouldn't have come along? I think, there's a, I think there's a strong chance, like, you know, Pink Floyd got together uh, for Live Aid. Uh, yeah. I, I think there's a, a strong chance that they'd have done something like that. Um, not not necessarily a full gig, uh, you know, two hour gig. But I I, I would have been less surprised, uh, you know, if they had all survived into the, that kind of era. Uh, I wouldn't at all been surprised to see them get together for uh, for something uh, like well, that. Well, so I think they would have. Well, do you think that it's true that um, John Lennon? I think McCartney is, I think that the four of them, you know, Lennon said, we want to give a, a farewell concert to Liverpool and we're going to play either in Walton Park or Sefton Park. That's what, mm. that's what I heard. I think I heard Lennon actually say that, mm. you know, he, he, you know, they were going to get together because as you know, McCartney was going o over to see him and, and Harrison, the two of them together, and Ringo was going over because he was always friendly with Ringo, wasn't he? But they oh, were yeah. going over just prior well, to him. Well, uh, Lennon and McCartney did play on a, what came out as a bootleg later uh, called The Toot and the Snore in 74. Um, and all of the band played on each other's uh, tracks from... Uh, time to time so you know they they very much uh kept performing musically together just not the four of them at uh any given time but the fact that the Lennon McCartney I'd not go far to say they buried the hatchet by then but you know the fact that they'd actually uh recorded 
um, albeit unofficially, uh, well, re released unofficially on a bootleg, Tooten and Snort in 74, um, shows that I think there's a strong possibility that uh, they might well have got back because they all enjoyed uh, performing. I mean, Lennon uh, stopped performing for quite a while. He became a sort of house dad, didn't he? For yeah, and also years, good, yeah. got back together with uh, John Lennon. After, after do, you think that, um, do you think Yoko was a, a, an influence on not the breakup? I'm mm. not going down there. Uh, about him becoming a, a house husband, sort of. I, I, I think so. I mean, John Lennon changed, uh, I think, um, quite a lot after he met Yoko. You know, I was saying earlier about it, um, it was very much McCartney that was driving the band after that. Yeah, know, particularly, it was. Pepper, particularly yeah. a Magical Mystery Tour. Um, yeah. And he even, as you were saying earlier, looking at those Get Back uh, tapes, uh, it was very much McCartney that was doing it. And Lennon wasn't, I, I wouldn't say he was, he was in the background, uh, but certainly it was uh, Paul that was much more um, to the fore. I, I think she had a, a big effect on him. I think, apparently, um, I remember reading about um, after his mother died, because uh, they'd only been back together again, I think, for two or three years when she was tragically uh, run over and I remember I can't remember the guy's name but uh, I remember reading this interview that uh, it was it was actually you know a personal friend of uh, John Lennon knew him well um, and he said that John really changed after his mother died he became a lot darker his humor became a lot um, darker after that so maybe he never really in a sense uh, recovered from that the thing is, you see, it, it's it's so intriguing, isn't it? The it, it, you know the Beatles, the Beatles break up, the Beatles music, then the Beatles break up, and we're still talking about it today. Absolutely, um, it's it, it's that the old cliche, isn't it? What if? Yeah, you know, with the death of Lennon, uh, would they get back together? And it's always this, what it? Yeah. And that's the sad thing about the greatest uh, band ever to grace the, uh, the stage, oh, as they say. Absolutely. Derek, Derek I, I'm, 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 I'm sorry about this, but that's we're right. on a two-hour special, aren't we? Right. Yeah. Now, just to get put things in perspective here, uh, so that the lads and the girls, you know, know what we're going to talk well what you're talking about not me uh what is it is it is it a transit is it from the 60s you know we're talking about the 60s then the transition into the 70s is that what you yeah, said we're absolutely gonna gonna talk about how music uh, developed in the 1960s rock and roll on both sides of the atlantic basically faded away um, yeah. at the end of the 1950s and the music scene in america at the beginning of the 60s was very different to the music scene in this country. In this country, uh, essentially, the uh, skiffle and English rock and roll bands uh, transitioned into beat groups. Um, and what we'll look at is how the music changed um, in so many ways. I mean, the rise of the, the bands that wrote their own songs. I mean, pe people like Roy Orbison uh, wrote yeah. a lot of his own material, uh, but it was very much not the norm uh, for beat groups. You know, you look at the first albums, you, you know, you look at the Beatles. I mean, most of them were, were covers on the first album. And by the time you get to 65, when pretty much the beat era was uh, running out, then you've got the uh, British Invasion, uh, was when the Beatles on the um, Ed Sullivan show took America by uh, storm. And then a load of uh, British bands went over there and uh, American bands were finding it hard to get uh, airplay. Uh, and then they both around 66, 65, 66, both came back together with uh, the likes of Cream and uh, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, and then on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, The Doors, Jefferson Airplane. And, you know, the music <clears throat> still very much, well, the music was very much blues based, uh, but it was much harder edged than it had been previously. <coughs> and then we'll take a look at how it uh, goes on to, to develop. Are you okay? Um, Go on. We'll probably finish, as somebody mentioned earlier, uh, the tragic death uh, at Altamont, 
which is really the spiritual end of the 1960s, the end of the um, the hippie dream of uh, peace and love and free concerts. So there's so much to talk about. Oh, brilliant. I'm made up at that. I really, I, honestly, I'm just made up mm -hmm. uh, because uh, Jason said, you know, uh, people are looking forward to the, uh, the two-hour um, show that we're going to do, which oh, is... Uh, Fantastic. Well, that's nice, isn't it? That's really oh, nice. That's brilliant. So, Derek, thank you so much for coming on tonight. And uh, obviously, going over your time, I made up that you stayed with me and answered the, the questions there, uh, you know, comments, that is. Yeah. Uh, and I, I thank you so much. I don't know what to say. You know, I know that you went out your comfort zone there and you've got a bit of a raw throat. And <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, I really enjoy it, Frank. Great talking All to right. you. So I'll see you in a, thank you, and I'll see you in a week or two, eh, Derek? Absolutely. Uh, thank Cheers, you, mate. Bye-bye now. Bye. Cheers. Bye.